everybody. This podcast is proudly sponsored by CardsReleased.com. CardsReleased.com has been supporting the game since Opus 1. Use promo code CHOKABROS to save 10% off your next order. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Chocobros. I'm your host, Sam Snipe Prime. Hi, I'm Zach Burrell. And I'm Cody Snodgrass. And this week we have what everyone's been waiting for. It is spoiler season, and we have a spoiler. Now, I am very happy about my spoiler. I have no idea if it's playable or not. It has an interesting mechanic that we have not seen yet. Um, it's not a keyword, so I don't think the keyword's coming out until Opus 10, right? Is that correct? I think that's what they said, too. Like, it wasn't going to be this set. It was going to be the following. But, that there but is... it is it is an interesting mechanic. Um, and so, Zach and uh, the Sweet Life of Cody have not seen this yet. So I just realized it's ahead. Zach and Cody. Yeah. I actually just yeah. realized that. Oh, man. And so, we're, we're, we're dropping it in here for them to see right now. Um, uploaded. So, if you guys want to read it out loud. Yeah, you have it. Okay, you do have it up. Oh, God, it's, like, small. Oh, I'll read it for you. Oh. So it's a 2CP Tonberry. Um, it is Earth. It is from uh, the set Crystal Hunt, um, or from the class Crystal Hunt or whatever. Um, it is a monster. Its job is Tonberry, so it is its own job. Uh, during your turn, Tonberry also becomes a Ford with 4,000 power. When Tonberry is put from the field into the break zone choose one forward your opponent controls deal it 1000 for every two forwards in your break zone huh so this card is really interesting um part of which i have to say is is well, let's go let's go over the the cons i'll let you guys process it for a moment um but one of the cons for me is actually just the wording um i i think it's very clear what it does uh during your turn is a 4000 power and when it's not your turn it's not a forward but the interesting part is it says it becomes a Ford with 4,000 power. Um, so it alludes as if it would use the stack. Now, usually we say we'll, we'll, when a card says or when it's triggering or it uses the stack. And this just becomes a Ford. It just is. So, it's a, it's a yeah, it, but it's not. But, it's, but it isn't a Ford. It becomes a Ford is what the card actually says. And oh, so, that so part, it's no longer a monster. I don't know. I mean, I that's what I think. It doesn't say also... Well, no. When, no, when it says Malboro also becomes. Beca- so yeah, also becomes a Ford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So also, both. Right, right. But what I'm saying is becomes makes it seem like it's going to use the stack. Right. It's not is a Ford. During your turn, Tonberry is a Ford with 4,000 power. Oh, shit. Yeah. You, you see what I'm I saying? Th- I think the term also becomes is to specify that it's still a monster. Whereas if it 100- says it is a forward, then yes. it's going to be – that would be like – Right, so it's very clear to us what it does, but I don't think necessarily it is as clear to newer players. Oh, okay. That, that maybe like it becomes a forward and it stays a forward. Also, this is the art from the sleeves. Yes, it is. Um, which is why I said you, I don't know if you guys know. I said that you guys have seen the art before. Mm-hmm. Um. So, so let's go over the the, the cons again. This card, uh, if you want the second ability, it's going to require seven forwards in your break zone. I think. To really be good. Oh, wait, is it round? Is it be fourteen forwards? Fourteen. Sorry, four. Yeah, because I want to deal seven k. So it needs to be fourteen forwards, right? Yes. Um. So that's to make it really good, right? Um. Then you can yeah. trade up like pretty well with it. Um. That's or just pretty kills. late to the game, though. It is right. The other thing is that since it's a monster, it requires you to play forwards in your deck now monster decks don't necessarily not have forwards a lot of them have a lot of forwards realm mira uh gal kafka mm-hmm. um they have lots of forwards cloud of darkness for example um but this requires you know the more forwards you play the better for this card um which is a, certainly not a mechanic we've seen before so there's some you know non bows for that part of it um this card is card- sweet with death machine death machine's not very good but this does help Death Machine. Okay, and how, how so? I haven't actually... So, it's a forward on... So, the reason Calbrena was so good with the deck um, and the way that it used to work, where it just checked for one, was because you could activate it on your turn so that you kind of float it, and then at the end of their turn, your thing dies. So that's when you want Calbrena to die. On your turn, though, if you activate Calbrena uh, to make it stay up, there's a chance that they could kill it and it comes back dull. And then mm-hmm. you can't like block the next turn, and it makes it worse. Whereas this one becomes a forward, so it's already a forward on your side on your turn, which keeps it there as long as they have a forward as well. So I don't think 
it's going to make Death Machine playable, but that's immediately where my brain went. <laughs> I was trying to well, do Well, it's interesting. That's, 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 that. a, that's a really great outlook for it. Um, it. It is on curve, though it is pretty small. But So there are a lot of pros to it too, though, right? Um, for example, or, or here, no, sorry, let me go over some cons. There's still some cons. It dies to your Shantono. It dies to your Cloud of Darkness. It dies um, to the, the, those types of effects. The, the really cool thing, though, is that during your opponent's turn, it doesn't die to their Cloud of Darkness. It doesn't die to their Shantoto. It doesn't, it doesn't die to their Cognoso. It doesn't die to their... Um, it never dies to their Valfor, basically. Um, it doesn't die to your Fanfrit during their turn. It doesn't die to your Exodus during their turn. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways that it's actually cool. It is multi-unit. It is a great Gao target. Um, so... I you know I don't I don't know I don't know I think the jury's still out for this one. I like that you brought up the Death Machine um, thing because Death Machine is probably still a playable card, just not a broken card. Right. Um, and maybe this is the kind of thing that, well, you know, Hunter Nance will try to break again. <laughs> um, I think this card's pretty good, but I can't tell how good it is because I I I think the power lies in its first ability, right? And we've seen other forward we've seen other cards like this. Um, you know, Aerith, Aerith untap ability is very strong, but not necessarily where it's best. It depends if you're having like a Yuri deck or, you know, whatever. Um, but some, some of those hinge on the Minwu effect. Uh, we've seen a lot of cards where their second ability is kind of just like the icing on the cake. Um, I think the fact that this is only a four during your turn makes it much more playable. Mm hmm Again, because it doesn't die to a lot of those things. Right. And it doesn't die to something like, <clears throat> they can't play a Duncan and kill this card. Yeah, you that'd know? be insane value because the like, right. effects they can't play a Tonberries mm -hmm. and kill it during their turn. Um, ironically, um, there's just a lot <laughs> of stuff that they right. There's a lot of stuff that they can't do. They can't like sh play a Schrodinger and force the bounce. I mean, there's those are small things, but they those types of things add up. Veritas will never kill this thing on entry, um, and so there's a lot of things that make this a very good card. Um, but I think whether it's a great card will hinge on if you can make that second ability work. Yeah, that second ability is definitely interesting. Like, well, let's think for a second. So, what cards do we typically want to play in most monster decks? It's Gao is the immediate one. Realm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do we are we Mira. playing Strago these days? Okay, Mira. Yep. Oh yeah, because this is Earth, up. so that for that lets you go into like the Puma builds and all that stuff too. Sure. Cloud of uh, Darkness. Cloud of Darkness. Good. The Wipe one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, which helps fuel this a little bit also if you yeah. have a bunch of guys. Not in my version, as I was playing Layla Viking, so Layla you had, Viking. You had so that's uh, what, Kefka. So Layla Viking, Gao, Realm, Cloud of Darkness, Mira. They're probably not all three ofs, but that's Correct. already 18 forwards if you did have three ofs. So right. late game, yeah. Um, right, and you're playing no, uh, usually playing no summons, in my opinion. Um, so a lot of the monster decks could be good with, like, Fanfrit, but nothing else really synergizes as well with them. Um but that being said, okay. yeah, so you can cut your summons completely to play this card. So, <laughs> really stupid idea. How about Strongest Sword Golbez with this card? No, it, it's another miss, though. It's a miss, but or like some kind of all forwards or very heavy forwards deck, because on their turn, they can't Shantoto it. And on your turn, if it, it trades dies, up within... it's going to kill everything, because your entire break zone is forwards. That's just a yeah. cheese idea I just had. But then you can go back to playing, like, Ingus to play standard nudes and stuff. So. Yeah, it's a cool idea. Um, I wouldn't even be opposed to trying it out. Um, but, yeah, it, 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 the whole effect is just interesting. Yeah. And I really can't wait to see if there's a water one. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because we don't have all – we don't – is this the first monster we know of from the set? I think so. And usually the monsters have a um, – they're like a cycle, you know? Yeah, like maybe there'd be. Um, imagine there's a water one where it checks how many summons you have in the break zone, to do some kind of effect. That would be cool too, but Reduce the problem is I, I don't, I don't want to like play summons in my water monsters deck. So, right, you want to play Cleo? Well, yeah, that might be like a yeah, yeah. card that like sits on the field and it dies. It could know, be, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's, it's the only we, monster you play. Yeah, so we already saw that. For example, there's the the wind backup that taps for ice. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it ice that taps for wind? Is ice that taps for it's wind, ice right? Ice that taps for wind, yeah. Okay. Um, see, seeing like that, like we we can hope that there is a a pairing of those. Like those, that's a you know, like hopefully there's a water earth one. Hmm. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I don't know if Final Fantasy has enemy and ally colors, kind of like Magic does. Right. Um, right. So if we knew what the ally so colors far, were, the cycles we have are all complete. So like, if you look at the standard unit ones, well, actually, I guess no, they're not because you have. Or yeah, you do. Because every element has a combination. So the Opus 7 standard units that are like, if you pay with this CP, you get this additional effect. Yeah. I believe there's a combination for all pairings. Uh, it's just some of them are base in one element and not the other. Um, well, yeah, I have to confirm that, but I think I think yeah. that's the case. The, and this the is a new category too, right? Crystal Hunt is a new category. Mm -hmm. One that yeah. we can assume will literally never be playable in title. Yeah, like Fat Chocobo uh, that was spoiled. That one is also Crystal Hunt and also the sleeve art. Yeah. Which makes us wonder if we're going to get another Moogle. Which, by the way, Fat Chocobo. Uh, is the Moogle art from... Oh, that's special. That's it's not a different... Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, this Fat Chocobo, by the way. Goblin Ring Leader. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's yeah, I like it a lot. Anyway, Cody, what do you think about this card? You haven't said much. Uh, One of the major cons I see... Well, I mean, it's just not like a major con, but Tom and Betty can't search it. Um. Yep, I, mm -hmm. I have it listed too. It is frustrating that Tom Betty is very specific. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but um, I think once you get to, I know it sounds like a lot, but eight forwards in your break zone. So it just trades it, up? You, yeah, most people will just let that damage go through. They well, won't that's, that's a good that. point. If it trades. Yeah. It's, almost like, it's almost like when you swing something small with like a lava spider on field, you don't want to like block and lose your good, like your good forward. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. This card would be much better if it was like Category 13, for example, though. Where you could have it and like synergize with Sarah or something along that line. Um, you know, I mean, you, so, some of the future monster decks might want to play something like Ark or Medine, and this card just really bad. That's a good point, actually, Cody. The whole trading up thing. I didn't think about that. The fact that it's, it basically deals 4,000 damage on a stick because it right. attacks. It's which is kind yeah, of I funny mean, since this little thing walking towards you like the Tomberries do, and they just kind of poke you. <laughs> <laughs> like you don't want to mess with it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, if you're, playing, <laughs> if you're playing like in a crow, which I mean, I'm not sure if you'd be playing it, but like even in a crow or like Maria, and any sort of like power Ingus, Mo Oh, there you go. The Mono Earth deck that's like super aggressive, mostly forwards. The EX deck. Play this. It Deals doesn't a have ton EX. Of damage. Uh... Yeah, that's true. But yeah. But and I mean, all those EXR summons and backups, but and a crow, you only need six forwards in the break zone to trade up. Right, game. which is not which is not that crazy, right? I mean, no, no, not at all. Especially, you know, we're playing less and less backups these days. <laughs> By the way, did yeah. you guys uh, see that there's a FF? There's a category fifteen searcher in Earth. Backup? Yeah, uh, uh, Reg yeah, Reg was, was, yeah. There's a couple of these I haven't seen yet. Sick. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so. This is our spoiler. It's pretty cool. I'm I'm happy about the spoiler. Thank you, Square Enix. Um, thank you, Richie. Thank you, Hobby Japan. Um, and and Kageyama for just giving us this chance. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, Very much. And so this great. is, I think, our best one yet. Yeah, probably for sure. This one, this one is really cool. Um, I, I was really excited when I saw it. Um, so thank you again. Um, so this week we actually had a request for a topic for a podcast, and that was uh, tournament prep. How do we go about tournament prep? And I imagine that even for the three of us, it varies um, <laughs> based on, you know, on how you're working. You know, I work with a, a, any given number of different people. Um, sometimes I'm working with the Choker Bros. Sometimes I'm working with Cars Evilies. Uh, sometimes I work with Meta Potion. Um, sometimes I'm working with just random people. You know, uh, this for this upcoming week, I plan on working with both Cody and uh, Jake um, for Kansas. Um so, you know, it, it, everything changes. Um, so who I work with can often change. But I think, like, one of the most important things to talk about tournament prep is uh, your expected metagame. Um, so what I mean by that is that every every time you go to a tournament, it's usually, I would say, pretty easy to guess what the metagame is going to be. Um, yes, this weekend was a little bit easier. We know that... Miami is surrounded by water, and thus, for some reason, the people seem to have an affinity for playing lots of water there. Um, we even had players from Tampa who don't normally play water that decided to show up with water. And so we, we had a, you know, when, when we were building decks, I was 100% saying, I'm going to build a deck that has to be able to beat water. You have to be able to beat water for this tournament. And I told everyone on the car ride up there, I told everyone at locals, like, make sure you're ready to beat water. It's, you know... Even the people that plan on playing water, make sure you're going to be able to beat water. Well, we get there and it's 36% water. That's a huge amount. 
Um, and so for me to be able to sit down and, you know, I played Ice Earth. Um, and so, you know, and I'll talk a little more how, how I got into that. But knowing that I was going to play against Mono Water, um, the one card I was sure that I wanted was Scale Toad. Um, because I feel like Mono Water, the deck can be kind of tempo-y, right? And so if they draw like their best tempo draws, you still have to answer their things. Um, but if they don't draw that, if they try to do the backup plan, they're in a lot of trouble if you play Scale Toad. And now the cool thing about Ice Earth and and this goes to talking with a lot of people is, you know, the night before the tournament, I talked a lot with Cody and I talked a lot with Brian and we were over this. Uh, Brian kind of was uh, had me leaning towards ice in the first place. Um, Brian was talking to me a little about Chris Neal's deck and I'm talking about Brian Berkeley, by the way, for those that don't know. Um, and he was saying, well, you know, it, these are the advantages. This is what it has. So, you know, I think I am going to play an ice deck. I think I'm pretty sure I'm going to play an ice deck. I was, and so I was pretty set that tournament. And here's another thing about tournaments. Always switch your deck all the time, <laughs> always, every minute, because that's that's how it's done, right? Anyway, so I go home, and I'm thinking, like, I, I've been testing Mono Wind all week, the deck that I basically said I would never play. And I had fun, and I did really well. I won a few tournaments this week with it. Um, but it just was it, it was it was more my style than I thought it would be. It was much more controlling than I thought it would be, so I had fun playing it. But there was something missing um, about the list. And then, uh, you know, Jamie um, from the Cardiac team showed up on, on Saturday and just kicked all of our ass with Ice Fire. Um, and it was just amazing. And the deck was just firing all cylinders, and it was really good. And so I was like, okay, you know, I really think I just want to play an Ice Deck. I talked to Brian. He said, play an Ice Deck. I messaged Cody, or no, Cody messaged me and said, hey, do you have an LQ? I'm like, yeah, I do. Um, what about you? And he said he did. And I, I said, well, yeah, one of us said, what are you playing or whatever? Uh, he said that he was playing Ice. I said, I, said, I said, I'm leaning towards Ice. And he's like, I'm leaning towards Ice Earth. I'm like, oh, me too. Um, and, and a lot of that had to do with, yes, it did well in um, Toronto. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that anyone else who was like, you know what, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, water here. You have to have the, the next game, the metagame, right? Like I knew that I wasn't the only player that knew there's going to be a lot of water. And the best deck against water is probably ice. So I said, okay, like I want to be able to beat water. I think that the metagame is going to be like, I, I guessed like closer to like 40%. I was pretty close, but I guess like 40% mono water. I mean, that's how many people play mono water there. There's a lot of aggressive decks though too. Like I was, I was told to prepare for a really fast, like lightning fire kind of haste stuff too, though. Not just water. Yeah, but there was one fire deck and one, yeah, one deck. A lot of people that they said oh. were going to be there just weren't there. So like right. the, the, um, the, the population that showed up, at water but the population overall of miami locals is not necessarily always that sure but the, the competitive players tend to play water yes um and and so you know i said well also what's gonna beat the mirror match and, and part of that i felt like was was scale toad um but also i really like the fact that the boards can get really big um in the mirror match and you're playing like like first off duke lark is probably like the best card i mean cody would you agree that that's one of the best cards in the mirror no, it probably is the best card in the mirror. Yeah, so like, so like, I know I'm playing three Duke Lark. It, it, it's no doubt, but also like that also leads to a really like degenerate board state on both sides, where cards that are like trumps, like Orphan, can come down and, and terrorize people. Sephiroth can terrorize people. These giant cards, um, and I said, well, you know what? I really need a reset button, and, and of course that button being Shantoto, um, and so I was pretty locked into that deck like right away. But what led me there too is, is it wasn't just Okay, I know the metagame. I know what to expect for, right? But I message every player that's better than me. Okay, I message Brian. I message Chris Neal. I message Makamoto. I, I'm talking to everyone I can. I message Cody. You know, I'm talking to every person I can uh, about every deck out there. I talk to uh, Josh Go about Mono Wind. I talk to um, Zaim about Mono Water. Hey, what cards are you fearing? What are what are the kind of what's the kind of stuff that? Why should I play Mono Water? Why should I play Mono Wind? Convince me, right? Now, I really don't have that much um, interest in playing those decks, but if they can convince me based off of their starting point of why their deck is good, it's certainly going to help me win in the long run. Um, you know, like the fact that, like, Lena Knight is, is a recovery option like no other, <laughs> right? There's no other deck that has that reset button um, because you're not just playing, uh, like, two forwards for the process of one. Sometimes you're playing, like, a, a 9K and an 8K, and then if they don't kill, 
that 8K, you have a reset button with like a Cognoso special in the back, you know? Um, so it's really scary. And so being able to talk to people and say, well, why would you play this? How would you play this? Or talking to, uh, you know, Brian and Oki about like, what would you play? Be? I know Oki said, I think the play is mono win for this weekend. And um, he, he based that conclusion based off of what everyone in his locals was playing. And it very well could have been the best deck um, for what he was playing for that weekend. But it's just interesting to think that, you know, you have to prepare um, based off those meta games, right? And so for me, it was Scale Toad. And so for this coming weekend, it's unfortunate. People, and I'm not saying Scale Toad's bad, it's good. It was very good for me. It was probably the best card in my deck. Um, maybe outside the mirror, like Duke Larg and Sephiroth were also very, very good. Uh, but Scale Toad won me every single match, period, that I played. Um, but I don't think the Scale Toad's necessarily... It won my game against Zach. I see him smirking over there. But Scale Toad <laughs> just dominated Zach. But I don't think that it's necessarily the best call for this weekend. And we have another one coming up in Orlando. But I think a lot of people are going to um, change over to the Scale Toad deck because it is a strong option. I'm not saying it's a bad option. I just don't think it's the strongest, right? You, if you can get one step ahead of that, that's how you prepare for a tournament. And so we saw that with Fire Cup, right? People showed up with stuff that was... Like okay, so people showed up with what was the best? You guys remember the best card you think a fire cut was? Veritas. Veritas. Very easily Veritas. Um, <clears throat> and, and it was very clear, but not everyone knew that. Not everyone got the member of the Veritas was the best card, right? And so what you saw is not just people showing up with Veritas, but the better players showing up with ways to beat Veritas. That's the key. And so you could show up with cards like uh, Thornton, which is a little bit out there, you know. Um, but it's still good. Schrodinger, like the Lightning for Story, Vikings, the Earth Moogle, I mean the 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 Wind Moogle, even cards like the Water Oracle or something like Jacob was playing, where like you get the Scry to, and then you don't mind breaking it. It's a breakable backup with it. You have cards that were already very good, like Mion and Zidane, right? Which are great things to, to break from Veritas. The best Veritas break is Veritas itself, probably. Because um, whoever starts a chain reaction, you know, it, it's going to be the, the most beneficial. Um and then what I think is like a really good anti-Veritas card is Galdez. I mean, the card just trades one for one, and then you get back a monster, or you make them discard a card, and, and oftentimes you've built your deck to sack those those things, so it's fine, right? And so I guess what I'm getting at is, is like you've got to be one step ahead. So the very first thing I do for tournament prep is I try and define what the metagame is. Uh, the second step is, is I talk to everyone playing those decks, and I kind of convinced me like hey send me what your best list is now let's say like if 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 okimoto is my competition for kansas right and i think okimoto is going to be on ice earth okay um uh, it's probably a little disrespectful for me to message okimoto and be like hey give me your ice earth deck um because i would need to prepare for it like i wouldn't do that now if i was working with okimoto and I expect us to share open knowledge that's different um but Point being is like, you know, I, I message people like Zaim who's not going to be in the tournament, or Okimoto in this case, Brian, who's not going to be in the tournament, and, and I ask them for their input. Um, and, and how would you go about winning these these matches? You know, I know Cody's Cody's not my competition at this this uh, this LQ, so Cody's not going to mind sharing his Ice Earth deck with me, which I took to great inspiration and in working with my Ice Earth. In fact, I think single-handedly it changed at least nine of my cards. When looking at, at Cody's list, I saw, well, you know what, I think Cody knows a lot more about Ice. Um I am not going to not play Scale Toad, but I'll cut the rest of the cute shit. <laughs> um, like, I had Noxus and Carbuncle and a lot of fun stuff. Um, but, I, you know, but I, I trust uh, his his advice. So, secondly, and talk about that, you play, talk to someone who's better than you at the game, or at least someone who knows more than you about a particular element or a particular theme or a particular play style. Um, like if you're going to play Scions, talk to Gregory Cole. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would agree. Um, it's the same reason... Okay, and here, here's some more into the prep. The same reason that we, during the um, during the ICC, right, I went back, and who did I test with? There, were, So I'm staying with a, a, a group of killers, multiple day two people, right? Who did I who did I test with, would you guess? Hmm. Alejandro, maybe? I'm nope. not sure. Who Zach should know this one. Who would you test with going into the Gregory Cole matchup? Gregory, Gregory Cole. <laughs> but... Sure, that would be preferable. <laughs> but again, I'm not going to ask Gregory Cole to help me beat him. Right. No, I tested with Chad. Um, Chad has probably played the most Scions out of any of our locals. 
Chad did, unfortunately didn't make it to day thir uh, day two, the top 32. Um, and But that doesn't say anything about his skill level. It just means that he got a little unlucky. Um, so there was nobody in a room full of, uh, of Crystal Cup winners like Brian, uh, you know, top 16 people like Jacob, um, you know, world champion, uh, not world champion. I always call him world champion, but he, he's the people's champ. Uh, but you know, world, world qualifier, uh, Okimoto, the person I trusted the most to test with was Chad. Chad knew the science deck in and out. Chad could say, here's what the line would be. Here's what the line would be. And Chad would play the deck. Probably not the same as Gregory Cole. They, there is not Chad's design, but the closest to it. Right. So I tested with the person that I think was the best at the matchup for that evening. Now that goes in to say something else too. Don't don't kill yourself over testing. Um, you know how many games I tested with Chad. I mean, we theorized, we talked a lot, but I played one game. <laughs> I knew it was an unwinnable matchup. And it was very hard. I played one game. He started with no backups. I like Zidane is only backup eventually, and then I won the game, and it was still very very close. And I was like, okay, that's good. I'm testing, and and all the rest of the people were like, you're not testing any more than that. I'm like. Nah, I just needed to know that I can win, that miracles do happen. It is possible that I win, and then I'll be good to go. And I'll just play my best, um, and that happens. Now, I will admit that going into the Crystal Cup, I probably had a lot on my plate. Like, mentally, I was not all the way there. I was very uh, just distraught over a lot of things that were happening, um, just in my personal life, nothing to do with Final Fantasy necessarily. But also a lot, you know, I, I didn't love the way the event was run. Um, just the, the venue was hot and sweaty. Uh, on top of being just, I was a miserable human being that weekend in a miserable environment. Um, and so I wasn't at my best. And so I didn't adhere to these things. And I didn't necessarily um, have an expectation. I knew that people expected me to top 32. Um, and so my goal was to meet that expectation. And I just barely did that, right? My my goal, and, and so I guess I guess the final thing I, w I was going to say is that another tournament um, practice for me is to set an expectation. My goal for the LQ was to win the LQ, right? And it's not just about saying I'm going to win the LQ, I want to win the LQ. <clears throat> like that's not enough. Really wanting it is enough. You have to ask yourself. You have to be the creator of your own your own uh, design. How am I going to win the LQ? And I really thought the best way to win this LQ again was play mono ice. Which is the reason that I was able, I was just 100% like, okay, Cody, yeah, let's talk about Mono Ice. Let's, let's talk about cards back and forth because I know that Cody just knows the matchup a hell of a lot more than I do. Um, and so, you know, it, and I had never talked to Chris Neal. Chris Neal seemed like a, a decent enough guy. I'd never talked to him before. But Chris Neal plays a deck. Uh, he played uh, Water Ice. I liked the list. I messaged him about, about the list um, just to kind of get – uh, what his, his thoughts were about it and, and his matchups and, and stuff like that and his thoughts on on certain cards and and that type of stuff and that's the kind of stuff you have to go and so i set the expectation and um uh, miami was to win um had i not won i would have been very happy that alejandro won or it, it had had zach beat me and zach been able to fight alejandro been very happy to see zach probably get crushed because it's the same matchup um <laughs> without scale toe though it would have been closer yeah. um and so I would have been happy no matter what who I would have been happy no matter who won, but that was not my expectation. I set my expectation to win, and that's what I went to do. And, and those, that's not always going to happen. Um, I I really feel like in the tournaments that I set that expectation, I tend to do very well. But but there are there are exceptions. I I I, I expected to top four nationals. That not because I think that I'm just that good, but because that was what I set my bar at, and that did not happen. I got utterly destroyed. Um, by the the deck I thought would destroy me, to be fair, um, which of course was Mono Lightning. Um, but so setting your expectation is really good. And then finally, also while you're playing, it's really important to like keep a clear focus. Um, always focus on the game that you're playing right now. Never focus on even if you're in a game two or three. Never focus on the previous game. There were times when I was playing as Alejandro in game two where it was like pretty sh like like by turn two I was pretty sure. I was qualified for nationals. Like I just had a very great opening start. I like ripped the scale toad right off the top on turn two. Like, and I was, I was feeling very good, but I kept telling myself, Hey, just keep playing this game. Keep playing this game. Stay in this game. And even more than that, stay in this turn, stay in this turn. Say, and, and that sometimes you have to extend it to the, the future turns, you know, worry about what's going to happen, of course, but don't think back. Oh, I made that mistake or, Oh, he could have done that. Or he, he represented this and didn't play this. 
and, and so like i'm very confused like i just stayed in the moment and stayed uh practicing like right then and there what i needed to like focus on right and the other thing is between every round and this is probably smaller than it looks but i go i take a walk i stretch my legs every single round zach knows that i asked zach to go hey let's take a walk let's stretch our legs even even when they're like well pairing's about to be posted i'm like all right well i'll be right back <laughs> gotta go stretch my leg you know i gotta get up and walk around get my blood flowing um and just getting a, a healthy place mentally um which i think is really i think really good to clear your head um because it's so easy even if you win the game to be thinking about that last game or mistakes you made and so you really just have to clear your head of like everything you've done and i in okimoto i know did the same thing when we were in canada we, we both went on walks together and, and talked about future matchups and stuff and how we're going to handle that next matchup we're always focused on the next thing it was it was never what happened prior um and so that's that's maybe how i go about it now you guys probably do a little different i know Zach, for example, he he went down and just hammered games like for like 16 hours straight. That's his way of testing, right? And you know, I I played zero games total on my deck before the event, which the is often actually I... how I have done things, which is not good. But <laughs> I, well, I, correct. I'm not, I'm not I saying talk it's and theorize a lot more than I actually play, and I figure out like Me too. this card is for this, this is for that. All right, this list though has this changed. Like, can I account for that? Blah. Like, it's a lot more mental, and then like you play a couple of games and test it for. Sure. So, so tell me a little bit about your play. preparation because you had decided um, rather last minute that you were going down there for the whole day, the whole weekend, um, yeah. possibly even Friday. You didn't end up going Friday, but it, but no, it was a no. consideration. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about a little bit how what your testing practice was for that weekend. So I had messaged a few people the prior week because uh, I'm like, hey, I need to do some grinding. Uh, but I wanted to play people that weren't at, from locals because I feel like I fall into a rut. It, this is a personal flaw, but where I start to play – what I expect the player to do, not what it's actually happening in the game or not what their board state would suggest in a general sense, but I start to focus too much on playing the player. And so I want to kind of play some people that I don't normally play often, but I know that have a style similar to mine, so I can kind of see what they do and how they sequence things. So I, I played with Sam Tool. Uh, I talked to Hunter Nance a little bit. Uh, I was messaging Lawrence. Um, just people that I have... I, Sam tool plays a lot of earth wind and that's originally what i was going to play for the weekend uh i was on his list from canada with i think two card differences and we played a couple games went through it talked about uh, matchups um ice earth was a consideration for a little while so i was between ice earth water wind and earth wind so very kind of run of the mill decks just it was a matter of which build um but after playing some of the water wind i just I'm not Alfred. <laughs> I, I don't have that same... I feel I hold things too much. I try to get those crazy combo turns and like get that really big swingy play, but sometimes I miss the little things in between. Um, I just don't have the experience on it, so I didn't want to fake it. Uh, Earthwind is very good, but I didn't... What ended up happening, <laughs> how I got off the deck was... There was You're a deck Johnny. Of... That's yeah. what happened. I ended up wanting to test a deck that I saw. Sometimes I get these decks in my head that I just have to like play a couple times, get it out of my system, and I can go back to real things. Um, but I ended up destroying with it, and it was fantastic. Uh, it was the Summons Mill deck from the Grand Open Paris, uh, played by Cle uh, Clement. Clement, I don't. Sorry if I butcher your name. Uh, essentially, it has ten forwards, eighteen backups, and the rest all summons. So it's just constant removal. Uh, it plays Unit H, plays five colors. Uh, well, five and a half, because it has one Medin and dark cards. Uh, and the deck is designed to just sit back, and you just remove everything they play. Uh, at some point, you Shantoto, reset the board, and then the game should be in your control from there. And a lot of decks right now, like Mono Water, no chance. There's I that, That's actually what sold me on the deck, was we played Ice Earth, and it was 50-50 all night. We, pl we played probably eight games in a row, me and Alejandro. We were... I think we went four and four. Uh, that, but he didn't have Scale Toad, <laughs> which was turns out that was a big difference. Uh, we played Ice Fire again. It was probably sixty forty my favor, uh, but I definitely didn't feel totally comfortable because there were some games where he was like, "Oh, this this hand's garbage," and then he just like played no backups and killed me because <laughs> I just I didn't have a Shen Toad or something. So, so you know, it's funny you say that because going into and that speaks to a lot about understanding the matchups yes right? exactly um and I told so him, like, going... that's what you might just have to do like i play three shantoto but i don't play yeah. a lot of earth cards so if i stumble on getting my chaos out for my cam or my charlottas or something like i may just not be able to play the shantoto when i draw it like on cue so like right. that's and, what and, happened and, that and... game and i got crushed 
So for play when when Jamie had played prior to Jamie playing you, we, you know he he's on ice earth or I mean ice ice fire, and we talked about some different opening lines that that he should have I think played against me like things that should have been different like uh, I'm very much of the if you have a Genesis in your hand it's fine to play lock on turn one, like I'm 100 percent behind that play all the time I think it's just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of went over those ideas in my head with him you know. And anyway, what ended up happening is, you know, after he beat, after he lost to you, I said, well, you know, w- did you go with a lock turn one play? Because I think that like forcing Zach to have an answer for it right then and there, and then and then he can't play his backups, and, and he has to be very careful with what he discards, because if he discards the wrong colors or doesn't draw the right colors, yep. he's in a lot of trouble. And then as soon as you put something like pressure on him with like lock or Genesis, that can be a lot of trouble. And, and mm-hmm. Jamie was kind of saying, well, no, I didn't think of it like that. You know, I, maybe I should have respected that line of play. The, what, what we found in the testing with Alejandro in that particular matchup, I won't stay there for too long, but was early aggression. But as soon as I flip it, if I go Shantoto, if I go like EX burst plus removal from hand, something like that, immediately go on the backup plan, get to five backups or like structure your hand so that you can you have a backup plan of building back up and then play the kind of mid rangey game. And then that was what, that was the way he could come back from that against my deck. Well, sure. Cause part, part of that is because one, well, after you dealt him, <laughs> A certain amount of damage and he's dealt a, a certain amount of death blows to your hand mm-hmm. that you're you are actually behind on the mill strategy yeah exactly so um, if you can so set, if you i don't deal damage to like milling. pain earlier or something yeah you just i'm right behind him and then i have to start overpaying for things to be able to riku every turn or something so yeah, right exactly at, at which point he comes back yeah yeah uh so we played that a bunch um the mono water he had a fine mono water start, but like Unit H is a house against mono water. Like uh, you get it's to Balfour or Layla Viking before they get Waka and just remove them both. They, that's one less Viking. If he ever plays a knight and the knight eats a Famford off an EX or something, remove it. And eventually he had uh, in the tournament actually against uh, Chad, he had played mono water knights. There were two times where he played a naked Lena. He just had no targets because they were all gone. And he just had, and all he had was just Lena and like the same name cards and that's all i could play and i was one for wanting every turn and just milling um so mono water felt very good which was like you said mono water was kind of the other half i was expecting a lot of aggressive stuff based on the way alejandro and david were talking but uh, i knew that water was kind of the other half of the or the other side of that coin so once i saw how good that matchup was i was like man i I just want to grind this deck out now (laughs) so once especially for a deck like this uh my preparation would be just play a lot of games and keep questionable hands to see how the game goes. I like keeping hands sometimes that are a little greedier to see what I can get away with and what I can't. And if like, I know a card is good in a matchup, but the rest of the hands kind of trash. Like, can I afford to do that in the matchup? You play enough games to get that kind of sample size to get that, uh, or to kind of gauge that. So like, uh, I learned a lot about playing Charlotta with the deck, uh, the different lines to get unit H and Shantoto out with only two backups or with, uh, four backups and, how you can sequence that, what backups I can play if other ones are already on the field or not. Just those little sequencing things are really important for me to understand. Um, so I, I like grinding the same deck a lot, but um, most of the process picking a deck is mental. Kind of just going through, looking at lists yeah. and studying. Now, now Cody, you also had a good weekend in LQ. Um, in fact, between the three of us, all we all we all top four of the LQs. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a pretty sick brag. Um, and it says a lot for our dedication to the game, thankfully. Cody, can you talk to me a little about your, your preparation? Yeah, so usually I, first off, always go to locals and play test as much <laughs> as I can. Yeah. Um, I'm always on the untap, so if anybody ever sees me on there, feel free to join in. Um, outside of that, I'll usually test my decks at locals. Uh, we have a pretty competitive scene here, so, like, there's not much, like, fun decks <laughs> like <laughs> usually like you sit down and it's like earth wind mono water uh ice water just everything that you you're t- typically would see the killers it. yeah oh, yeah yeah and they're all getting all of my locals are very good now um so uh outside of going to locals um usually i audible decks at the very last minute that's <laughs> like my, my staple go-to move i um, i know the feeling <laughs> Yeah. Uh, outside of that, make sure you're comfortable on your deck, which is why you'll see me most tournaments, or almost every tournament, I'll either be playing Mono Ice or Ice Earth with, you know, 41 Ice cards or 
50 or 40 ice cards probably or wind water uh, just because those are the two decks i'm most comfortable on so like i'll never even if like earth wind might be the best deck in the meta which arguably it is you'll never see me playing that so always go with something you're comfortable on so comfort level is big for you too yeah um Absolutely. Uh, actually I, i'll make one more note uh another reason for picking this particular deck was the enjoyment factor like i had a blast playing it i love playing slow control decks especially they're coming from magic playing like blue white control oh, and stuff. i'm i'm very and much in that field that's that's why we get along <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of how we met uh but i like i tested mono water and i was just miserable playing it the whole time it's just so boring like it's a very it's fun when you get those crazy like scholar turns, but just overall I just didn't enjoy it. Mono, mono but, water used to be more like mono blue control. Uh, yeah. It's not so much more, so and, much anymore. And ice earth, actually, I'll, I like ice earth, so I'll skip that one. But like water wind, again, like I said earlier, I just it it didn't feel right to me. Um, I don't I don't know the lines. I feel like you need a decent amount of experience on that deck because your guys are pretty fragile. They're not like giant nine Ks, or you have to know when to play your one of Ishtola or whatever, when to pitch your one ofs and like you know when to get yuri when to get chalinka that kind of stuff uh, and then yeah and earth wind i think my biggest problem right now with earth wind is i don't know what build is correct and i always want to play yuri Ange, so <laughs> yeah i just I, I i have a tough time letting go of pet cards in that deck so i just i went away from it yeah so so something that's interesting to know too so although we talked about um <clears throat> picking the right decks for the right tournament which we think is also pretty important obviously i also think that Ultimately, the deck that you choose um, has very little to do with how good you do. Um, and, and it's more how you play. Every every matchup does feel winnable in every single game. Um, Which is very I think frustrating. That, <laughs> right. I think that there were some, like, as dead as Zach felt against me, there were some misplays that he had that changed things, you know? Um, that that happens in every game. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that there's also this aspect of... of in, in life, we have this, this this constant battle of nature versus uh, nurture, right? Um, Cody's very much a, a nurture type of person. Cody's all about, I'm going to learn ice, and I'm going to learn it the best, and I'm going to be the best ice player. Um, heaven forbid I run into the other best ice player, Chris Lopez, that we're just going to have a <laughs> slugfest, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's what happened. Um, that being said, I'm very much like, I will just pick up any deck and try to play it. And I will play it to the best of my ability. And I am just trying to play the best um, game individually that I can. And that's part of the reason that works for me. Whereas what I think ultimately works it, for those that are tournament prepping. And the reason I think that I won the LQ is I just cheated and took the best of both routes. I took basically Cody's list because he put all that nurture into it. And I was like, you know what? I know the meta game. I'm gonna spe- I'm gonna put Scale Toad in, and I'm gonna play every game with Scale Toad in mind, right? And and that worked for me. And that's one of the things that works for me. So you can also lean on examples like that, right? If you were sure that Wind Water was the best um, deck for a given tournament, right? Uh, Zach, how did you be convinced that Wind Water was the best ter- deck for this tournament? Clearly, it wasn't because Alfred terrible. <laughs> um, but you could have gone to Alfred, got his list, and then made some innovations in it, right? Could have, yeah. And so it's really interesting that I think that for those that are trying to prep for a tournament, ultimately, I literally don't think that anyone who does well at a tournament does so alone. Now, there are some people who are probably prodigies, and, and they do. Um, and that's great. But they would probably do even better if they actually worked with people. Um, if they bounce ideas off each other. Um, again, I have a lot of my credit for my win going to Cody um, and uh, a lot of it going to Jamie and a lot of it going to Brian. Those three people, the three people that I just kept bouncing off ideas. Uh, sometimes they shot me down. Sometimes I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> Cody hated... Don't play Scale Toad. <laughs> no, you know, Cody hated my original list and it was probably pretty bad. Um, I'm trying but to ultimately. What it was. Uh, like, I said, my, like I said, it had Terra, Noctis, and, and Carbuncle. So we were on the dull oh, other geez. guys forever plan. Um, but I, it was cute. But it, it but it ultimately <laughs> wasn't good. Um, but, you know, I bounced off ideas off people who were better than me um, in order to help me succeed. And I think that that's really important for your, for your next tournament prep, right? 
is is you can look at your locals and you can lean on them a little bit but i promise you that even if your locals has the best mono water player you know if you're if you're if you are part if you are in the dc area and you're playing with zaim every weekend hey great lean on him for the mono ice matchup right or mono water matchup but like don't ask him how to beat cody if you want to know how to beat the mono ice deck talk to cody that you is know, a question reach- i ask a lot is I'll, I'll reach out to somebody like what are you afraid of like what do you lose to and what do you feel is like your like what what matchups don't you like and why don't you like them the, the important reason is why it's like someone it's easy for someone to say oh mono water is a bad matchup it's like, oh, okay if you just for move sure. on there, that's not very helpful. It's like getting very specific, like, well, if they do this and then this and then play this card, I'm done. You know, that kind of thing. So we were testing a deck. So Brian, Oki, and I were testing a deck for um, for uh, for Canada, which was Earth Wind with no Dataluma. And that sounds crazy, but a lot of the right, matchups, you just, you just know. <laughs> it wasn't even that. It was just that you don't need the Dataluma. You just don't need them for the matchups. Well, we ended up coming to kind of a conclusion is, is two things. One, we actually missed the Cactar more than the Dataluma. <laughs> the Cactar allowed us to kill things with Diabolus, and most importantly, combo with Noctis, um, as well as trade up our Ishtolas and our Aerith, or even our VVs and stuff like that. Or our, even our Clouds trading up into 10 cases is kind of important in the, in the Ice uh, matchup. Um, but also, one of the other things is, is I talked to Alfred, and I said, hey, you know, what about the matchup do you hate about the earth win and he's just like well if you set up dataluma plus cactar i can't win <laughs> okay that's fair well we know jordan dank is probably one of the best uh wind water players out there so we're gonna expect not only that he's gonna play it but that people will respect his decision to play it and also play it i think that's a very uh underlooked thing people will respect the best player in the room and they will play what they're gonna play um, you know, I have no doubt that in Kansas, people see Aaron playing uh, Earth Wind, and so they're gonna play Earth Wind. Like, I don't, I don't even know if Aaron's the best player in Kansas, but he's certainly up there, right? And so people respect him as such, and so they're gonna play that list, right? And so we thought, well, he might play this, and I think we might need to cactar Dataluma back in our deck. <laughs> and so there goes out all the other cool stuff. Um, so I, I really think. It, the tournament prep part has a lot to leaning leaning on stuff. I know that like recently I was talking to uh, Rice about like uh, his uh, his upcoming LQ, and he had already leaned on Cody because he was saying the same like Cody was telling me the same thing that that Rice was telling me that Cody was telling him. <laughs> um, and so it, that was just really interesting to see that uh, because Rice is a smart guy, and he's going to lean on other players like Cody just as I would or just as anyone should. Um, which is just a really cool aspect of this game. It actually speaks out about our community. Um, and again, speaks totally against uh, the theory that like it's this game is very team based, <clears throat> team oriented. Um, because again, like I've never talked to Chris Neal. I hardly talked to uh, Matthew Rice. Both of these people are open for talking about our upcoming LQs. Um, you know, I, yet I work with my team over at uh, Evil East, where I work with Jamie quite a bit. I talk to Zayim about matchups. I work with my team at Choker Bros quite a bit. Um, and so I think that ultimately um, the best the best tournament advice that I think that we can give you is, one, you all have your own play styles, just like the three of us have our own individual play styles. Um, and so stick with that and, and do that. But if you're not someone like Cody who, who just knows the good ice cards versus the bad ice cards, like I can't look at an ice card and tell you if it's good or not. Um, but I can play the deck. If you give me a good deck, I can play it well. So lean on lean on your strengths and then lean on other people to fill those weaknesses. Um, and then, you know, other than that is the basic stuff is, you know, take care of yourself, drink lots of water, all that stuff. All that stuff's really important. I did eat lunch before the event. I did drink a, a bottle of water. I'm not saying any of that had anything to do with me winning. Who knows? No, but it, it certainly, it, it didn't hurt, right? No. Uh, my brain was fueled. I don't remember making misplays. And that's very rare for me. I make a lot of misplays. Your brain's just blocking I, them out. I well, <laughs> I also kidding. I okay, but let's talk about the <clears throat> night before. The night before, I made sure I got a decent amount of sleep. I took Benadryl. Uh, I had a toothache actually, so I took um, Tylenol for that too. And I took um, 
what other stuff does it make you go to sleep? Melatonin. I took melatonin also. The day of the event, in the morning, I took two Benadryl so that my allergies would subside because I had terrible allergies. And I wanted to get the sleepiness out of my system right away so I could sleep up on the way up there and not have allergies. You, oh, Same. okay. You're saying, okay. So you did sleep in the car after taking two Benadryl. <laughs> I slept in the car after taking two Benadryl. Okay, I was like, if I, I took two Benadryl before a tournament, I'd be asleep on my playmat round one. Like, <laughs> Well, so my, my idea is like, listen, I've had terrible allergies this whole week. I know that I'm going to have terrible allergies then. I have terrible allergies right now. Um, so I'm going to take care, uh, with a preamble of this stuff, you know, and then I made sure I got food. I normally eat a foot long sub. I ate a half of a sub so that my brain wasn't overloaded. I wasn't going through like a food coma. I gave my other half of my sub to Jesse. Um, and I had, you know, I got him a soda cause that's what he wanted. He's a grown ass kid. He can make his own decisions. And I decided I was going to drink water. Um, and I love soda. So I, I drank some water. Um, and you know. I, and, and, and I guess what doesn't hurt is I got a little lucky. <laughs> and on that note, too, uh, that's actually why I went up a day early is uh, after I made the decision, it kind of sucked because then I heard James Lockwood was coming to town and we're going to have a nice big locals. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to drive up in the morning like you guys did. And then but I was the only one in my car. So, like, I didn't have, you know, I couldn't rest in the back seat or whatever. So I wanted to make sure I could get good rest that night and I could afford to wake up later because I was staying with Alejandro. So like we got to drive like what, 45 minutes to get there or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that definitely helped me as well. Cause I yeah. am notorious for not sleeping before events or not getting enough sleep. I, I guess it helps. I drink coffee now, but <laughs> pretty so one last, kiss. one last thing. And, and please God, this is really important. If you take, I, I feel like this podcast has been important, but if you take anything away, please take this away from this podcast. Okay. It is your responsibility to be aware of tournament structure and stuff like that, okay? If you show up to an event and things aren't what they seem to be, fix them. Make sure they are. They immediately announced top eight for us, and I immediately no served them. Like, I would have rather it be top eight, but I know that the rules are top four. I don't want anything about it to be legitimate. It's top four. Understand, hey, no, 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 no. It's not untimed. It's 70 minutes top cut. Mm-hmm. If it goes to time, it is a double loss. Okay. Um, if the, the finals is untimed, they're using no, Konami software. Yeah. So. Well, they were right, so it would be a double draw in that case. Um, point being is that you need to, you have to know these. Don't come back and start complaining about Square Enix and how the 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 shop that you played at doesn't didn't run the by the by the official rules and. You can reach out to the the North American page and say these things. You can reach out and and ask these questions. And I think it's important to do so. But more realistically, you should already know the answers to these. People should know that if it's not 24 people, it's a cut to top four. At 24 and up, it's cut to top eight, right? Um, we we you know at, at our event we had people the the first off I they handed me my packs and said thanks for playing. I was like, uh, trophy? Uh, we don't we didn't get a trophy. Uh, you, you did, you did, you did get a trophy and you got very expensive promos. I promise you, you got them. Uh, we didn't get them. Um, I said, please just check with your manager. Okay. Calls his manager. Manager comes in front. We've been emailing all week. Uh, we haven't got any response from Square Enix. We don't have anything. We're sorry. We'll mail it out to you or whatever. I'm like, okay, this is some really expensive promos and play mats and come on. Like, but I didn't say that. I said, I said, okay, I, I understand. Let me know if you see them. I'm going to go outside. I'm going to actually just call the Square Enix rep and just see what's going on. And just, I kind of just BS. I literally went outside and called my wife and was like, Hey, honey, guess what? I won. It was really exciting. You know, like she was really excited for me. I want to be, I want her to be the first person. Um, and I came back in and, uh, they're like, Oh, we found it. And I was like, Oh, okay. Where was it? Oh, it was in the back. And it's like, well, you were the manager. Like, but it's fine. Anyway. So they open it up. They're like, we don't know what to do with these sleeves. I'm like, Give them out the top four. And he's like, there's eight of them. And I'm like, okay, so at least give four of them out. Like, I don't I don't know what you want to do with the other four. I'm not your boss. Pulls out two play mats. What are we supposed to do with these? And I'm like, top two. Pulls out two Laswells. What do we do with these? Top two. No, four well, Laswells, but two of the uh Oh, eight, I'm not, not, not I'm sorry, the Rubans. Then yeah. pulls out the Noctis and the Laswells, and there's or there's four of them. He's like, what do we do with these ones? I'm like, top four. You know. Point being is that like you, when you're going to a tournament, you need to know who the judges are in the room. Um, know what the rules are for the event. Know what is expected of you as a player. Um, 
you know, no, there are a few of my opponents, and I let it slide. There are a few of my opponents that, for sure, in a Crystal Cup, I would have called a judge on their sleeves, one hundred percent. I, I, they were marked, not necessarily purposefully. Um, I wasn't going to go through yeah. them. There was <laughs> dirt on them, stuff like that, mm -hmm. and you don't know if that person's memorized where that dirt is. I mean, it's really not that hard, right? I mean, you could you could do it in thirteen seconds. You could figure out, you know what it is and so point being is that like i knew what's expected of me and i know what's expected of them um and going into the tournament that is really important make sure you know the expectations and the rules and the way things are and yes mistakes are going to happen i've clearly made a some of my own water brawn or earth earth brawn gate 2018 or was it 2019 um <laughs> so I, I know that those mistakes happen but know the processes know the way the system's supposed to work and make sure that it works as intended. Um, that's really important. I can't imagine if if Cody showed up to a 25 person event and they're like cuts and he makes fifth place and they're like cuts the top four. He's like, hell actually, no. Actually, I have a question about that because we had a ours was 34, 35 players mm -hmm. the LQ this weekend, uh, but they actually went to top 16. And I, didn't, no. I thought that was very incorrect. It's, um, it's, re it's got to be the reason why I was wondering why when I won mine, I won mine. You're like, I'm getting ready to start my top four. I'm like, what? You're only an hour yeah. behind. Yeah, and actually Rice and Oki were like, so did you win? Like, what happened? And uh, But no, uh, apparently, well, I saw the piece of paper that was in the kit, and it said something like along the lines that it was up to the store's discretion. That's interesting. That's news to me. Yeah, and there was no, like, 24 cut to top eight or 16 cut to top four. Okay. And, and so, and part of me is, and part of me is, that's what I'm saying is, is you have to know the standards set forth. Um, it's pretty, it, we've been told before, like from official sources, it's 24 is the cutoff. Correct. For eight. Anything Correct. else that's for, I don't know what the cutoff Correct. is for 16. I'd imagine it's somewhere there is in no like cutoff that I know forties or sixties, but I don't think there's a cutoff like 40, 64, 16. somewhere in there. I don't know that there is one at all, period. Yeah. Like, for an LQ. For an I LQ. believe that LQs are cut to top four or top eight. That's what I thought, too, because even, like, the California one that Oki won, it was 40, P, 40 players, so, and they cut went to the top, top eight. eight. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, and that's what it should have been. Yeah. Now, granted, um, I was stoked because me and you, all the Kansas like guys. Ninth? No, me and all the Kansas people all made top 16, so that was cool. No, oh, but okay. what, what was your placing in the before the cut? Uh, fifth. Okay. But see that even that changes things, I, I, and I'm not saying you you deserve the win or anything. Like, had you played better or had you not gotten unlucky or whatever it is, maybe you would have won. But the fact is, is that maybe you didn't win realistically because the 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 cut was wrong. You never know what your matchups would have been. You know what I'm saying? Right. Knowing that going in and knowing the rules, knowing how things work, I think is really really important and up to the players. The information is out there. I'm not saying that like it's perfect or that Square Enix has done the best job in the world. They are improving. Um, but you need to know the information being out there. Every event you go to, you should be expected. You don't show up to uh, a Magic GP and not know that it's competitive REL. You know, uh, like you, you know, no different than than sh trying to rule Shark Zone at, at your at your F and M for for marked sleeves you know like realistically i would just tell my if my opponent's sleeves were obviously marked i'd be like you, you gotta change your sleeves dude in this case they weren't they were just they weren't clean and this was just more than one person who i played against i'm just like yeah i don't i don't like it i tend i what i do is i i have character sleeves but i tend to get new um uh perfect or new the ones that protect like the character protecting sleeves mm -hmm. i get new one of those for big events so that my sleeves are never marked um, and you know it helps that it keeps all my character sleeves in perfect condition because I love those character sleeves; they're really cool. Um, so that's that's it from from my tournament prep. Do you guys have anything you guys want to add? Um, also, in regards to the LQ, like I think a lot of like just in regards to the it cutting the top sixteen, a lot of newer players or maybe players that have just not played in many big events are okay with it going to top sixteen. Sure. Like. Like me, Lopez, uh, even Craig, uh, Craig Dobson, uh, we we just all looked at each other when they said top sixteen. And we're just like, well, people are always like, you know more like sympathetic towards I, things that help them, right? So right, right, right. Well, for 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 anyone, I would say anyone like first through fourth seed, like they should be thrilled. 
like the person who went like x3 is now making the top cut you know yeah. or like the bad x2 is now making the top cut and their first round gets easier now their second round would theoretically still be the same but they also have the chance that that person that's better gets knocked out by some random like, person you know sam prime gets knocked out by his bane of existence illawar or something <laughs> yeah like, like that, that that could just happen but so like that eighth place seed that's normally playing first place seed now plays ninth place seed you know and so that's really strange um and the ninth yeah. place seed could be a whole different like a whole nother loss mm -hmm. and then now that person gets in and so it just it really changes things no and I, there was definitely like two of my buddies from locals they had to play each other one would have made it to top eight one wouldn't have the one that made it was playing mono water and the one that wouldn't have made it was playing Fire Ice. And Fire Ice oh, has Jesus. a good matchup against yeah, Mono of Water. <laughs> so like, he pretty swiftly won 2-0. And then now, mm -hmm. instead of me going against Mono Water, which I I don't know if that would have added up correctly. You mean Ice Fire? No, no, no. I'm saying like if it was just Top 8. Right. Right. Uh, there would have been Mono Water in the group. There wouldn't have been Fire Ice. Right, now so I'm you, going could up have, against... you could have played against a great matchup. Yeah, so now I'm going up against Fire Ice, which is kind of like a 50-50. Right, yeah. So, but which by the it's way, interesting. Aaron Wiseman's my hero. I just looked at his deck list from the event. It's fantastic. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, I actually had the buy round. Oh, you one. say that one's awesome, but mine was a pile of garbage. Oh yeah, hundred percent. He's, he's playing as many colors as I was. <laughs> I walked by it and saw his opening hand. I actually had the buy round one, mm -hmm. so that was. So did Sam. Uh, huh. So, <laughs> okay. So Aaron, we oh Aaron Wiseman. Oh my god, what a what a madman! I'm just looking. Six at copies phone. of rain. Oof, man. It was funny because I, I walked past him and he has... Man, you're a madman. He had like a wild hand that was like just... It had rain. It had fire. It had everything in it. All different Dude, colors. This and guy's he always Maverick Sharks. Yeah. That's yeah. fucking badass. <laughs> but yeah, Aaron mulligans into like a perfect Earth Wind hand. Like Simi, Star Sybil, <laughs> Sherlota, Mog, Eleven. I'm like, you just did, got rid of a five color hand. And, and ended perfect. up in a meta deck. Yeah, like, <laughs> how does how did I find myself here? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I thought this deck was sweet. But... Man, now I have to play that before I go back to testing the one I was already on. <laughs> but yeah, or or you or you just don't have to. I get that itch in the back <laughs> of my brain, man. I gotta scratch it. <laughs> it's cool, and I'm all about Dark Fina Renoa, but well, Dark Fina Phoenix and Zero Miss too. He's playing Zero Miss. I know. Oof. I see it. You know I like the card. Get back those rain specials. Anyway, let's <laughs> let, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else you guys got on the topic of preparing? No, I do want to say congrats to just the team in general. Like us, us going uh, three for three and top fours, um, and what I think are absolutely killer, killer games with with just the strongest of competitions. Um, just speaks a volume for us and so i'm proud of our team so good job guys i i appreciate that yep we got one down there's two more to go <laughs> yeah and, and i do want to shout a special shout out to to patrick folio who i've been rooting for for quite a bit making top four is sick um yeah he's coming I, second twice i believe and top four once I yeah so I'm, so I'm rooting for him i'm, I'm hoping uh, that that next week's this week if not we'll see him in kansas so yeah no, absolutely all right, guys, well, we've been the Choker Bros. I'm Cody Snodgrass. I'm Sam Snipe Prime. And I'm Zach Burrell. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the Choker Bros podcast. Be sure to drop us a like and comment on our Facebook page or subscribe and comment on the YouTube page. If you have any comments and suggestions, especially about Cody's awesome hair, feel free to drop us a DM. And, of course, don't forget to check out CardiVillies.com and use promo code Choker Bros to get 10% off your next order.